On July 26th of 2009, the San Antonio, Texas police got a frantic 911 call. It was the sister of Audie Sanchez. She'd found her sister had killed her own three and a half week old son, Scott Wesley Buckles Sanchez, in the bedroom covered in blood. While Adi's sister pleaded for an ambulance on the phone, Sanchez was screaming in the background, I didn't mean to do it, he told me to. She claimed she was at the direction of the devil. To track Sanchez's journey, we've gotta go back in time. Adi was documented as saying she'd been hearing voices since age five, according to the report from a psychiatric evaluation while she spent time in jail. The voices were often good voices telling her everything is going to be okay, according to the report. But she also heard bad voices. One voice in particular named Lucy, which told her to do bad things like eat my hand, she said. Sanchez was mostly able to live with these voices and mild paranoia for years, but slowly in her adulthood, Sanchez's mental illness worsened. Her behavior became erratic. She had trouble staying employed, bouncing from one low paying job to another. She worked at fast food restaurants and briefly as a home health caretaker. In 2006, she admitted to first experimenting with drugs, which is also when the voices she claimed to hear intensified. Following the voices she heard, she was led to Austin, Texas in an attempt to track down a former boyfriend, Scott Buckles, who also suffered from mental disorders specifically schizophrenia. The two had a dysfunctional on again, off again relationship. While wandering through Austin, Sanchez walked into a CVS and prowled the store for the next seven hours. Police arrived and took her to the Austin State Hospital where she stayed for 16 days due to mental distress. She was diagnosed with psychosis by the doctor at the hospital. However, in a reckless choice by the medical team, she was issued a prescription. It was the first time her family learned of the severity of her mental illness. After her mental state stabilized, Sanchez was released with a prescription. The nurses at Austin State Hospital referred her to outpatient care in San Antonio. Later on June 20th, 2008, Audie Sanchez was seen again at a health center. She arrived at the Center for Healthcare Services back in San Antonio, Texas. She was diagnosed as paranoid, mildly delusional, depressed, and psychotic with hallucinations. The doctors decided her medication needs to be changed. Adi was noted as saying the voices went away while taking her psychotropic medication, but it was too costly and wasn't able to continue taking it. She ended up not continuing with it and shortly thereafter became pregnant with boyfriend Scott Buckles, the fellow schizophrenic. During her pregnancy, she sought counseling for depression and expressed her desire to not take any medication. Adi delivered her baby without any complications or incidents of any kind. Once her son was delivered, her OBGYN prescribed antipsychotic medication. Sanchez had given up medication during pregnancy, but now said the drug made her too tired. She stopped taking it shortly before she attacked her baby. Then, weeks after the birth of her son, on July 20th, 2009, Adi was taken by EMS to Metropolitan Methodist Hospital. She was asked by the hospital staff if she was feeling suicidal or homicidal, a strange move as most new mothers wouldn't want to answer honestly out of social stigma and worry if they were to answer honestly, the government might take away their child. But Adi was already having paranoid thoughts about this exact possibility. Adi herself requested that she be hospitalized, but she was discharged to her family's care. 11 minutes after her psych evaluation ended, Sanchez was discharged from the hospital at 3.53 p.m. She was sent home with the name of a clinic she could contact for outpatient services, but she wasn't given an address or contact information. She never followed up or made an appointment. It was clear she wasn't really able to follow up for herself. It was reckless of the hospital to just not follow up. I know they have so many patients, but still. 
In the days leading up to the killing of her son, Adi started feeling deep sensations of paranoia, fearing people were spying on her and plotting to take her baby from her, or that other mothers were breastfeeding her baby. She wouldn't let Scott Buckle's mother, Kathleen, hold the baby for these reasons. Kathleen didn't let this behavior go unnoticed. She told Sanchez that she seemed erratic and paranoid, that she needed to seek help. At that, Sanchez abruptly got up and fled the house. Kathleen Buckles called law enforcement and told officers that Sanchez had run off with the child and was an unstable schizophrenic. The officers took no action. The worse her paranoia got, the louder the voices in her head got. Sanchez reported the voices in her mind told her the devil was in her son. She was unable to look him in the eyes, and his face would change in front of her. Six days later, she was back in the emergency room. This time, she was escorted by police officers. At the time of Adi's arrest in 2009, three different mental evaluations were conducted by three different doctors to determine her mental competency, ultimately declaring her insane. While in custody and getting mentally evaluated, she explained more of the messages she was hearing at the height of her paranoia. She was quoted as saying, the voices in her mind told her that her mother had killed President John John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe, and that the KKK was mad at her mother for killing JFK. The voices also told her to hurt her son Scott. She ended up killing him with a kitchen knife and eating some of his body. During her evaluation, she said, the voices told me to eat his insides. I was a harlot because I had committed adultery. There was a demon in my stomach and that the demons would come out of her stomach if she ate Scotty. This had to be done by five in the morning. Scotty would evolve and he would no longer be possessed. In the weeks after her killing, prosecutors wrestled with a difficult decision. Should Adi Sanchez face criminal charges or be sent to a state hospital for treatment? Despite her medical history and all of the evidence that Adi was insane at the time of the killing, some folks in San Antonio called for the death penalty. This included Scott Buckles, the father of her child. He's quoted as saying to a television reporter, I think she should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. She killed my son. She should burn in hell. Audie was charged with capital murder, but ultimately the court stated she was not guilty by reason of insanity. She was sent to a state institution. In the end, through proper diagnosis, it turned out that Sanchez was suffering from a condition known as postpartum psychosis. It's a rare and severe form of postpartum depression, paranoid hallucinations happening in the minds of new mothers, often leading to violence. Postpartum psychosis and its potentially horrific consequences became national news during the trial of Andrea Yates, the Houston woman who killed her five children in 2001. Adi Sanchez had been enduring a mental health crisis for at least a week before the killing of her child. But when she reached out for help, she ultimately didn't receive the kind of care she needed. This is such a tragic story of a person who ultimately just needed some serious mental help and couldn't get what she needed. Her story serves as a brutal commentary on the lack of mental health access that sweeps across the nation, as well as officials not prioritizing a warning sign of shaking mental health, especially when the symptoms are being expressed in a person taking care of a newborn. Austin was born in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida on December 21st, 1996. Growing up, Austin's parents had very different ideas of how a child should be raised. Austin's mom, Nina, wasn't someone who felt the need to hover over her kids. She had a pretty solid relationship with both Austin and her younger daughter, Haley. But Austin and his dad, Wade, didn't get along. Wade was a really forceful and strict parent. People described him as a nice man, but she said he had a temper. When Austin was 13, his parents got a divorce. 
Not long after the split, both Nina and Wade got into new relationships, which had to be a tough thing for the kids to witness. Once he graduated high school, he applied and was accepted to Florida State University as a biology major. He was interested in health and medicine and his dad was in the medical field, so it kind of seemed like he should go that route. But Austin later changed his major to exercise science because he wanted to become a dietitian. This is where the body obsession started kicking into high gear. He mentioned in his journal that he felt that no one really knew him and wanted to become well known. He didn't know what his path was and was begging for guidance. He needed a purpose in his life. Emotionally, Austin was really vulnerable and was finding it hard to cling to normalcy. His Google search history was filled with searches like, how do I know I'm not crazy? And common traits of good people. He was trying his best to come back to reality. Everyone could see the switch in Austin, but something completely overtook him in the final weeks leading up to the attack. He wasn't even a fraction of the same person everyone knew him to be. And this is when Austin started to believe he was Jesus. He thought he harnessed special abilities and was immortal. On the flip side, however, he also believed the devil was watching him and waiting to end his life. Austin's family had a history of mental illnesses and schizophrenia was one of them. Austin also developed a really terrible sleep habits, sleeping just two hours a night. And at other times when he was experiencing extremely high mood levels, he wouldn't sleep at all. No sleep plus hallucinations. This guy was living in a constant state of fear. A few days before the horrific event took place, Austin's dad brought him to a weapons show where he brought a switchblade. He asked multiple people at the convention to give him tips and tricks on how to protect himself. This is at the same time that Austin had started believing he was half dog and half human and telling his family this information. It was evident that he was just unwell but people didn't know how to help him. But then on August 15th, 2016, Austin woke up with a lot of energy and decided to go for a run on the beach. When he got there, he got down on all fours and began to run across the shore. After this, he went to his dad's house to get the car keys. As soon as Wade, Austin's dad, saw him, he knew something was wrong. Austin was acting erratically, and his dad offered him to calm him down, but instead of taking it, he threw the bottle on the ground, demanding his car keys. Wade didn't give up the keys because he wasn't in the right state of mind to be behind the wheel. This set Austin off immediately. He climbed onto the hood of his dad's car, started jumping up and down, screaming at the top of his lungs. So his dad handed him over the car keys. Later that night, Austin, Haley, Wade, and Wade's girlfriend went out to get dinner at Duffy Sports Grill in Jupiter, Florida. Austin ended the dinner abruptly because he said he felt trapped. He marched out of the restaurant and went to his mom's house. Once again, when he arrived at his mom's place, she could tell that he was really going through it. He wasn't on meds, but was acting like he was. She drove him back to Duffy's, which turned into another huge blow up argument involving Wade grabbing Austin by the shirt and yelling at him. Austin was sick and was tired of being told what to do by his dad, who pushed him around his entire life. He clenched his fist like he was about to fight Wade, but before anything could happen, Austin broke away from the situation and started wandering down the streets. He ran in and out of traffic, not fully present in reality, and because of all that, he thought he was unstoppable. Austin's confidence soon shattered when he spotted a dark figure that looked to be following him. Austin then ran to the garage of John and Michelle's home. John and Michelle were in their 50s. They had been together for 10 years, and both had successful careers that allowed them to retire early and enjoy their lives. Austin saw the light from the garage and ran to it for help. He thought the dark, shadowy figure was still following him. And because of this, he was screaming bloody murder. This scared the two of them and Michelle started yelling back at Austin, probably for him to chill the out. But once Austin saw Michelle screaming at him and waving her hands, this flipped a switch in his head. Something told him that she was an evil being and he needed to end her life. Austin was carrying the blade he brought from the weapon show and began to use it on Michelle. He impaled her multiple times before turning his attention to John and doing the same. Their neighbor, Jeff, heard the commotion and ran over to help, but Austin turned on Jeff and gave him multiple injuries. By the grace of God herself, somehow Jeff was able to run back to his house despite having multiple head, neck and back injuries. He immediately picked up the phone and called 911. Meanwhile, Austin found a machete in the garage and began to use that on John and Michelle. Later on, investigators would also find a pair of scissors. Now at some point during the attack, Austin drank a bottle of liquid he found in the garage. It was a bleach-like chemical that he believed to be alcohol. And at midnight, Austin's mom made a phone call to the police. She was worried for Austin's safety due to his strange behavior and running off from dinner two separate times, but had no idea that Austin had committed these horrifying acts when she called. When the police arrived, 
at John and Michelle's house, Austin had taken off all of his clothes, made animal noises, and continued to attack the couple's bodies. But when officers approached, they were even more horrified to see Austin biting into John's face. It took a dog, a taser, multiple police officers, and a kick to the head to finally remove Austin because he was clung to the body so tightly. This is such a difficult case to learn about because while I'm not excusing what Austin did to this innocent couple, there were so many signs that led up to this point. I mean, it was so evident that he was unwell and needed help but didn't get it. Sadly, John and Michelle did not survive their extensive list of injuries and were pronounced deceased at the scene. Austin was transported to a hospital because he had also sustained some pretty intense injuries. He had burned his throat from drinking that chemical from the garage, his liver and kidney both failed and lots of external and internal injuries. On the way to the hospital, he groaned that he had eaten something bad. When asked what it was that he ate, he replied, humans. He continued to have his manic episode at the hospital and was so all over the place that he needed to be sedated. This led police to believe that this was a substance-induced incident, but a toxicology report proved their suspicion wrong. Wade knew what had really caused this though. He told the media it stemmed from their family's history of schizophrenia. On September 7th, 2016, Wade Haruf appeared on the Dr. Phil show. He said he couldn't excuse what Austin did, but that he generally was a caring person. Something had just gone so, so wrong. After weeks of recovery in the hospital, two months to be exact, Austin left the hospital bed. On October 3rd, he was transferred to jail while he awaited trial for two counts of first degree murder, attempted murder, and burglary. Psychological evaluations were performed on Austin and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, acute manic episodes with psychotic features, and lycanthropy delusions. Which makes sense because Austin couldn't recall much about the attack besides believing that he was a dog when biting Michelle and John. A prosecution psychiatrist declared that Austin was legally insane during the attack. Austin's legal team was planning to argue he was not guilty because of insanity, which has now been postponed indefinitely, it seems. He's being treated for schizophrenia while he's in jail. If he is found not guilty, he will be admitted into the state mental hospital to get the treatment he needs. But that, my friends, is the case of Austin Haruf, the cannibal frat boy. So I gotta know, what do you all think about this case? For me, I think this guy was incredibly mentally unwell and it went unchecked for a really long time. He was either totally unaware of what he was doing or doing it to protect himself somehow. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, let me know what you all think and I'll see you next time.